It's Sunday morning, and we are in a study on all of these teachers in America and the false doctrines they're teaching. I don't see anybody in America that's really teaching the complete Bible without any reservations. Nobody. The closest that I see is John MacArthur. He preaches predestination, and he turns around and says, how can predestination and free will walk hand in hand? He said, I don't know, but they do. That's not true, John. He, pre he baptizes people in water. I heard, him having a, I heard him having a baptismal, water baptismal service on radio one time. And on the radio, he said, if we baptize people the way we should, this shows you that he knew something about true baptism. He said we'd put them under the water and we wouldn't let them up. That's what he said. Now, he knows there's a spiritual baptism. It's a blood baptism, evidently, but he cannot afford in his church of 5,000 on a Sunday morning for two different services, he can't afford to tell them the truth about baptism. I heard him one, one year, about five years ago, say, I'm going to be teaching next week on the pagan origins of Christmas. I said, I got to tune into that. So the following week, I turned on the radio at the time he was coming on. And John said these words. He said, I am familiar with the feast of Saturn or the Saturnalia being at the end of the year, uh, December the 17th through December the 24th. And he said, I'm familiar with December the 25th being the birthday of Mithra, the sun god of Rome. And then he said, however, I went, whoa, what do you mean, however? However, we're going to use this season to glorify God. And I just want to say, John, the Bible says, therefore shall you keep mine ordinances that you commit not any one of these abominable customs. I want to say another verse that you're very familiar with, John. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. Now, John is the closest. He'll preach a real good predestination message, and then he'll beg people to come and accept Christ. I don't believe even Spurgeon did that. He would plead with people. I don't believe in invitation hymns. I believe God is his people chosen before the foundation of the world. All you have to do is tell them the truth. Is anybody here in the habit of arguing with their family members over these truths? Quit that. You, that's not going to help. You tell them the truth, and if they are elect, somewhere they'll believe God. But not by your timing, by His timing. He's got a timing for everything. That's what Acts, the 17th chapter, says. Look at that real quick. This is one of my favorite verses on the timing of everything. Acts, the 17th chapter... And I love this verse, Acts 17, verse 25. God is not worshipped with men's hands as though he needeth anything, saying he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Everything comes from God, everything. Let me write that down, everything. from God. And then he says, And God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell upon the face of the earth. He's made all men. And then it says, He's fixed the timing of everything. Everything. This is why you don't have to convince somebody to believe God. And hath determined the times before appointed. Determined is the word horizo. Well, that's an interesting word, isn't it? 
H-O-R-I-Z-O. Prohorizo is the word predestinate. And since horizo is an aorist indicative verb, anytime you see an aorist indicative, it is past tense. Being past tense, you can put pro before it. So God is prohorizo, pro is before, and being an aorist indicative, you can say God has prohorizo or predestinated the times, kairos. Times is the word kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S. We get the word karometer from that. A karometer is a timepiece. And this actually means uh, a proper occasion or time. An occasion... So God has determined all occasions, all occasions. It sounds like that he's declared the end from the beginning and from ancient times, everything that's not yet done. If he's determined everything that's not yet done in your life, he's got a timing for everything. The timing has been predetermined. And the times has been before appointed. Protasso is the word before appointed. Pro tasso. Tasso is a word that's real common in the Greek. It means an orderly arrangement. It's the same word in Acts 10:48, where as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. It's the that word ordained. Tasso, it means an orderly arrangement. Arrangement. Orderly arrangement, and pro means before. God has predetermined the timing of everything, and their orderly arrangement, and they'll happen exactly when God wants them to happen. You don't have to convince anybody of anything. Boy, if we can just learn, at 80 years old, God has taught me this. Live your life, do the best you can, and all the results belongs to God. That's the way it works. We don't have to worry and stress and strive over anything. If you stress, you know who ordered that? God. Until you stop stressing. He's ordered you to stress and get all bent out of shape until he wants you to quit being bent out of shape. And you wake up one day like I did at somewhere in my 60s, and I was hassling people and stressing out over them. Does anybody stress here? Let me see. But <laughs> stop that, Eric. <laughs> and I noticed <laughs> my grandson Jonathan had his hand up. I know you probably worry. <laughs> I think that's funny. We can stop that if we can learn that God's got all this appointed. The timing is set. And then he says, and the bounds of their habitation. Timing has a boundary line. Katoikia, K-A-T-A-K-O-I-A. -A. The bounds of habitation is the word. K-A-T-O-K-I-A. Okoya is the word family. Kata means down. It means a place to settle down. The timing of everything is set. Even your worrying. And when God wants to cause you to stop worrying, he's going to make you get fed up with you. You're going to say, I am tired of this stuff. I hadn't been able to figure out how to overcome my opposition in life, so I'm just going to bow to it. Whatever happens, bow to a car wreck. I had bought a brand new 87 town car. Boy, it was pretty. It had a blue carriage roof. 
It was white leather seats and had blue piping around the seats. And I was turning into the real estate company where I worked down here on Gallatin Road. This in 87. And the car was about six months old, and I was proud of that. I'd drive up beside somebody with a town car. I'd think, well, your town car is not as nice as mine. <laughs> I'd, do, I'd think exactly that. But at least had sense enough to know that if something happened, that was God. I was trying to turn into this real estate company, and I had a lady with me. I don't remember her name. And we was going in there to get a key or something. And this guy's coming straight at me in a pickup. And I saw he wasn't going to stop, and I yelled at her, he's not going to stop, and I pulled to the right. He took the whole side out of my brand new, beautiful town car from front to back. I got out of the car. Somebody thought I was crazy. But I, s <laughs> this had nothing to do with Hollis. And I said, I made the statement, look what the Lord has done. Some woman said, are you all right? Are you out of your mind? Or what, what's wrong with you? I, God woke me up there and ripped the whole side out of that. That was God's doing. If he's determined everything and the time to it pointed, He's prearranged it beforehand. This occasion, it has been predestined, predestined for that to happen to me. And everything that happens to you has been preordained by God. There's a verse, I didn't even mean to go to this, but I got to talk about it. Before I get on the message, let's go over to Job, the 14th chapter. Job, that goes with this verse. Job 14. Job 14, verse 1. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Let me add to that, that God has arranged the trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. Your life is like a shadow. I'm 80 years old now and I, it seems like just a few months ago that I was 18, graduating from high school. Just doesn't seem like no time. It's gone. Life is a vapor, the scripture says. It's gone. And dost thou open thine eyes upon such an one and bring us me into judgment with thee? Who can bring a clean thing out of unclean? Not one. You can't convince your family to believe God and believe predestination. That's not possible. If he doesn't convince them, they won't. All you can do is give them the truth and then leave them alone. Don't give them an invitation to him. Don't get them to pray. Say, God, save me of the sinner for Jesus' sake. Amen. That don't help nothing. Seeing man's days are determined. Karats, C-H-A-R-A-T-S. Here's the word determined, C-H-A, R-A-T-S. It's, it's like having an engraving. It's decide, it means to decide or decree or to have a pointed sharply. There's a point for all things. He's determined the number of man's months are with God. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. He can't go. God, God has done the same thing to the waters. He set the waters, and the only times the waters can overflow is when he rains a lot. Or only time it will dry up is when he sends no rain, and it will be whatever God wants in your life. All of your actions are determined by God. All right. Now, I'm going to get back to what I've been teaching on. If people understood this, they'd understand predestination. It's not just God's elect that's determined. 
It is every action in your life that's determined. Everything that happens in your life. When the difficult times come in 1 Peter 1 and 2, the Bible says we are elect. We elect unto obedience. Here's what we elected to. Elect unto obedience and the sprinkling of blood. You wouldn't understand that verse at all unless you know what a blood baptism is. Spread to sprinkle means to asperse a fluid or to asperse blood. You're not even going to understand that unless you know what a verbal noun is. A verbal noun is called an infinitive. What it means, it's a noun any way you slice it. It's a noun. Baptized was originally a noun. When the translators got to the word baptizo in the text, they were stymied. They didn't know what to do with it. They looked at it and said, well, it is a noun, and it's verbal in character, and they knew that. They did not know what to do, according to uh, McClinic and Strong. You look up baptized, it'll say it's a verbal noun. If you know what a verbal noun is, it means the movement is not on the subject, not on the person. It's not on that. It's on the fluid that's coming upon the person from an outer source. And it comes from bapto, meaning to stain with the dye. So what the translators, according to Girdlestone and according to McClinic and Strong did, they said, we don't know how to translate this. So they simply took this noun, which is a person, place, or thing, and they turned it into a verb and called it baptize. Now, some of them wouldn't know what to do with certain, ver certain infinitives. When they got over to Acts 10, 48, and Peter is at the house of Cornelius, and he commands them to be baptized Now, when you look up to be baptized, or you're looking to be ba baptized in, and it says in the name, to be baptized is one word in the Greek, baptisthenai, B-A-P-T-I-S-T-H-E-N-A-I. It's a form of baptized and enai. E-I-N-A-I. -I. Enai is a word that means with. When used with an infinitive, this word E-N means only with or by. And Peter commands them to be, to be baptized with the name Onoma, that means authority, and God's name is his word, is the word of God or his authority, is his authority is his word. So when, you, when you're talking about what they did, they took this word baptizo and turned it into a, you can't alter the word of God, but they did. There's a lot of mistakes in the King James Bible. It's not the King James Bible that is the inspired Word of God. Boy, that makes all the so-called conservative Bible-believing preachers across America angry. 
You guys are ignorant. Any Greek teacher worth his salt will tell you this. The true word of God is the textus receptus, the Greek text. You can't actually translate Greek into English. This is an interlinear Bible. This is the Greek on the top line. The English is under it. I don't even trust the English in this because I don't believe they got a lot of the words right in English. I have to go through sometimes one word at a time to find out what something is meaning. Now, so everything has been ordained by God in your life, including your poverty, including your wealth. Everything that everybody has is God's will. God gives some men so much money that they can't possibly repent of it. When you're Bill Gates, one of the richest men in the world, you can't repent of that much money. How could a man like that take his cross and die daily? People say, you're judging now. Yes, that's right. I'm judging righteous judgment, John 7, 24. I'm judging according to Matthew the 10th, Mark the 10th chapter, how hardly shall a rich man enter the kingdom of God? One of you that are rich, you have your consolation. You've got your comfort. How can they be humbled, poor in spirit, meek? Bill Gates is not meek. None of those super rich people are meek by any degree. I believe they're all going to hell together. Along with, I've been teaching on the false doctrines of the charismatic movement on Sunday morning. The whole world is corrupt. The preachers are corrupt in America. The Baptists are corrupt. They're washing in water, just like John MacArthur. They're, they're getting people to accept Christ when you can't accept Christ when you're dead in your sin. They're getting people to pray a prayer when prayer means to bow to the will of God. If you're a lost person, and the Bible says, how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How are you going to pray to a God you don't believe in when you're dead in your sin? You can't. You have to be birthed by the will of God. We were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God's will. Of his own will begat he us. We're begotten by the will of God when we don't even know what's going on. Does it register on us? Certainly it does. Somehow, God moves upon our minds and our hearts, puts us within hearing of the Scripture somewhere. You might be listening to a radio, listening to a lying false teacher, read out of the Bible, and that can convict your heart, and then he goes on to lie to people and tell them to send all their money. The charismatic movement tells people they take the Bible and twist it into something that it's not. They tell you God wants you rich, and the more you give, the more you're going to get back. They tell you if you give, you'll get a hundredfold back. So if you can give $1,000, you'll get $100,000 back. If you believe that, you're a sucker. That's just not true. When the Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit, it's not talking about the poor in money, but it would include that to some degree. Poor is the word P-T-O-C-H-O-S. It means those who are destitute of spiritual things. Well, that's you're only destitute if you are a elect of God and God's going to deal with your heart. I said a while ago, we're elected unto obedience. We're elected to obey God and to be blood baptized. How do we obey God? He learned obedience through the things which he suffered there in, my, in Hebrews 5. We learn there in Hebrews 12, he scourges every son he receives that we might be partaker of his holiness. Holiness is a form of holy. Hagiosmos, H-A-G-I-A-S-M-O-S. 
It is a form of holy, H-A-G-I-O-S. Holy means single or pure. So you have to be purified by God, by the fire, by the scourge. Now you think that things that happen to you are unfair. Everything that happens to the elect believer is within the will of, it is the will of God. It's not somehow Satan gets to do things to you. Satan is the servant of God. He is not a co-God. God uses Satan to chastise his family. He uses him for that, to beat you into submission. The word scourge, I used to wrestle with that until I looked the word up. I used to think, well, is this a Jewish scourge where they would beat people with a stick, maybe three whacks or four whacks? No, it's not the Jewish scourge. It is the Roman scourge because that word scourge is mastix. It comes from the verb form mastigao. The scourge or the mastix was a whip, a little short whip, had these leather thongs on it. And in the leather thongs, it had pieces of glass and bone and metal. God says, I will beat you with the Roman scourge until you start partaking of my holiness. What he's doing is getting rid of self. Now, that don't sound like this doctrine that the charismatics preach, does it? Not at all. He said, I scourge all my children so you can partake of my holiness because you're basically a sinner. When you, when you are born again, it's the inner man that's born again, but the outer man is alive and well. You can read that in Romans 7, Ephesians 4, put on the inner man, Ephesians 4, Colossians the third chapter. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. You can read about that inner man, put on the inner man in these chapters here. And perhaps some more that I have left out. But God beats you over years until you begin to die to the flesh. And that's the holiness that you come to as he whips you with divorce, Losing your car, losing your house, not having enough to live on. Has anybody been there? I have been there where I didn't have enough to live on. When I was in Fort Worth going through some real hard times, I'd go by my Aunt Lois's house. I'd say, Lois, can I have your Coke bottles? I could get two cents a piece for them, and I could sell enough to get 15 cents to buy a loaf of bread in 1960. That's what it would cost, maybe 15, 16 cents. I have been in a struggle in life to live. And so God has beat me to cause me to be willing to be holy before God. When it says holy means single, you got to get rid of this double-minded man here. You got to get rid of this pride this self, this, you got to get rid of all the things that you are by nature. And you got to think, people, want, they tell me, you talk about the Bible too much. Well, that's all I talk about all the time. Why not? That's not what I used to talk about. I used to talk about money. And I was very dumb when I was in my 40s. No reflection on some of you. Now, Everything that you have or you are comes from God. I want to go look at some verses here. There's a verse that the charismatics don't even, evidently don't know in the Bible. They say you can ask God and he'll give you whatever you want. Let me give you a verse they use. They use this in Matthew 21, 22. And it's got this through the Bible several times. Look at Matthew 21. 
Matthew 21 and verse 22. This is a favorite verse of, I always say Copeland and Company. Kenneth Copeland, since Oral Roberts died, since Kenneth Hagin died, he's more or less the father of that movement now because it was through Copeland that all the, most of these other preachers, Jesse Duplantis, Creflo Dollar, and the list goes on and on. T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jakes came in through the preacher up in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, can't quite think of his name. Huh? Parsley. Rod Parsley. Rod Parsley is like a circus. I don't, have you ever watched Rod Parsley? It's like watching a circus. They were, one Sunday, I just was watching. I want to see what they're going to do. Golly. And they're all swinging back and forth. They're singing, celebrate good times. Come on. They're doing cool in the gang. <laughs> Are you out of your minds? They take his song, sing his song about celebrating, and they call it for Jesus. Rod Parsley is just one of the biggest liars walking. They claim to heal the sick. Rod Parsley's got a son that's autistic. He doesn't know what's going on. And they set him right down on the front row. And he sits there while they heal all the leukemia and the cancer throughout the church. And one night, they were having a healing service, and I was watching. And Rod Parsley says, bring the healing pillow, pillow over here. And they bring the pillow over, and he places his hand on the healing pillow. And R.W. Shambach, we talk about a sham, he placed his hand on it. And R.W. had a, had a Band-Aid on his hand. And I thought, why don't you heal that cut under your Band-Aid? That's simple compared to the leukemia you're going to have out there in the audience. Just heal that first, rip it off, and throw it away, okay? The stuff they say is insane. Now, where was I? I was looking here at Twenty-one. No, I don't know where I was. Twenty-two. Matthew twenty-one, twenty-two. Twenty-one, twenty-two. All right. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. They say, see, all you got to do is ask God when you ask when you want it. Anything you desire. The only problem is. Ask, prayer, and believe are all conditional words. Let me put this on the board. You can't just ask God for what you want. I was watching David Jeremiah one day. I watch these guys. Why do you watch them, Jim? I want to hear their lies so I can take notes on them. So I can correct them when I get in the pulpit. David Jeremiah said, somebody wrote to him, said, what does ask mean? He said, I went through my library, went through all of my books, and I couldn't find anything except it means to ask. <laughs> David, you're an ignorant teacher. You didn't define nothing. Ask is the word I tell. A. I-T-E-O. Prayer is the word prosukumai. And believe, this is prayer. Ask. And believe. Believe is the same word as faith. It's just the verb form of faith, which is the noun. Believe is the word 
P I S T E U O. And faith is the word P I S T I S. You see the word P I S T? That's the stem of the word. Now the Bible says, We receive the things that we ask. This is over in 1 John. 322. Before I go into this, let me give you a couple other words that ask. You can get all of this. This is not some trick I pull. I don't go through and read all the verses in a Bible that has this. All you actually need is a word study concordance. Look up your look up your concordance word and then look up the same word in a word study concordance and it'll give you every time it's mentioned in the Bible. Now this word, iteo, iteo, is mentioned 71 times in the Bible. And you've got the word, itema, A-I-T-E-M-A, which is a form of that, A-I-T-E-M-A, which is a form of the word, ask. Then you have the word, itea, a i t -E I A. Itema is a word over in Philippians 4 and 6. Philippians 4 and 6. Let your request be known unto God. And it says in prayer and supplication. Supplication is the word D S S D E S I S. It means to bow to, to supplicate. Tony Curtis used to make movies about princes in the, in the Far East, and he'd speak with a Boston accent, say, to hear is to obey, Sahib, you know. Sounded like he's from Boston. And that is supplication. It's when you bow to the will of the king. So you have to bow it comes from the word D-O-U-L-O-S, which is the word slave. Slave. Deasis comes from the word D-O, which means to bind oneself to the will of the king. So you can't supplicate or you can't make request unless you understand what the word ask is because itema is a form of the word ask. And they, it is a conditional word. You can't just come up and say, well, that means what I want it to mean. No. He also says in John 14 and 13, whatsoever you ask in my name, ask is the word iteo. I'm going to give you iteo in a minute. I told you that's a legal term. You can't just ask God for what you want. Now, it's also the same word, this word, itema, or itea, A-I-T-I-A. It's the same word to show you how legal it is that Pilate used, itea, when he says, before the crowd, he says, I find no fault. In this man, Jesus, I don't find any legal reason, no lawful reason to put him to death. And the people said, if you don't put him to death, the Jews said, we're going to tell Caesar on you and he'll transfer you out here, put you somewhere in, in uh, Alaska or something. We'll tell on you. Pilate didn't kill Jesus because he wanted to, he killed him because they, Jews, demanded it. He was afraid of the Jews because they had trouble with them constantly. Now, so it's the word, I find no fault in him. You find that in John 19 and 6. And then the Bible relates the death of Jesus in Acts 13, 28. They found no cause this is the same word, no cause, to, to put Christ to death. Then you also have the word A-I-T. 
I-O-N. Ition, another word that's legal for ask. And you find there in Luke 20, Luke 23, verse 4, I find no fault. It's basically the basic same word as itia. And you find in A-I-T-I-A-M-A, -A, a basic same word, complaint. Anything that is a complaint has a legal reason to it. Well, then let's get to this word ask. Whatsoever you ask, it has a legal definition. Let's go look at it. I've given it to you before. You can't just say you get whatever you ask simply by asking God and believe you're going to get it. If you believe that, go over to, go to Calcutta, India, where there's a million people starving in the streets and tell them all, all you have to do is ask God, He'll give it to you, and you'll have a new car in three days. You can't say that. Look over here in First John. We're going to give you the word ask. You can't just come up and say, what you ask in my name, believing you shall receive it. All right, look at First John. First John 3. All right, I'll get there in a minute. Just wait for me. First John 3. Here's the legal reason for asking. How many times does something have to be in the Bible for it to be true? Once. once. That's right, once. John 3, 16 is in the Bible one time. And it's true. Now, Look at verse 22. Whatsoever we ask, I tell. This has got conditions to it. We receive of him because of two things. Two things. Because, number one, we keep his commandments. Number two, we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So if you're not doing the things that are pleasing to God and keeping, this word keep, boy, that is a difficult word. Most people think that means to do all the commandments of God. Well, you can't do that. I got the list of the word keep. I'm not going to go into them. Maybe just one word over there. Maybe one word over there in, in uh, John 15. Go to John 15. If we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing. All right, and I'll give you a couple of these things. You can't, that's one of the favorite verses of all the Charismatics and Pentecostals. You get whatever you want since by asking for it. That's what David Jeremiah said on that program I heard him. Well, you just ask. That just means to ask. No, it doesn't. David, I hate, I hate it that he's got righteous name like David and Jeremiah with all the lies he tells. Now, look over here in John 15. Or John, let's back up and go to John 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. The word keep is the word tereo. Let me put it up here. T-E-R-E-O. Tereo means to guard. Guard against loss. 
It means you are a guard of God's commandments. Where are his commandments written? On the fleshy tables of our hearts. If you hear someone say something out of line with the scripture, you say, that's not true. Tell people what things mean. I'm out in public. Somebody says something. Well, I say, that's not what that means. I've said that a hundred times or hundreds of times. And usually people won't pay attention, just go on talking. I say, if you want to know, I'll tell you. But I'm not going to throw my pearls before swine if they don't want to know. So it's as though your heart is a vault and you're guarding. It doesn't mean to do them all. You'll, you'll look at somebody and say, I may not be able to do all commandments, but I'll fight to the death that they're the truth. That's what guarding against. That's what Terrell means. Well, those guys that say these things, they've changed the meaning of words, twisted and perverted the word of God. Now, he said, you'll keep my commandments. How many commandments are there? Well, there's every time an imperative mood is used in the Greek. Greek. Imperative is a command, just as much as a command as thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. When the Bible says, humble yourself under the hand of God, humble, T A P E I N O O, means to level self. Actually, according to one writer, said it means to level mountains and hills. There's two mountains in the Bible one is Zion. And the other is Babylon, and Babylon was a proud mountain. They were founded on self, or let us make us a name. God says, get rid of the mountain of self. Bow to God's will. That's what the word prayer means, prosukamai. comes from pros. So if you ask in prayer, first of all, you're keeping the commandments of God. And you're not allowing anybody. First of all, you won't let anybody change the word ask. First of all. You say, look, you can't ask anything you want. You have to be pleasing to God. What is pleasing to God? Keeping his commandments. Doing the commandments of God. Death to self pleases God. Death to self. Probably my favorite verse on what is pleasing to God is Romans 12 and 1. Look at Romans 12 and verse 1. This is what's pleasing to God. You can't ask God for anything you want. First of all, want is the wrong word. Want means lust or desire. You can't just lust after anything you want. Ask in prayer, believing. Believing is death to self. Prayer is death to self. Asking is death to self. The only thing you can ask for is, in fact, there's a verse before I get any further. I better give it to you. In Mark 11, here's another place of this word, I tell. Mark 11, this is a verse they use, the Charismatics use, Kenneth Cope and all the rest of them. This is a verse they use when he says in verse 23, if you'll say to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. A mountain was the capital city of an empire. Peter was arguing with Jesus about killing a fruit tree. It was against Jewish law to kill fruit trees. The last two verses of Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter, unless the fruit tree was five years old or older, not bearing fruit, and Jesus just killed a fig tree. And they said, behold, the tree you cursed is dead. Don't you know, Jesus, it's wrong to kill fruit trees? He said, you have the mountain of Babylon in you. If you'll say to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. Every time Babylon goes down, it goes down into the sea. 
in Jeremiah, the 51st chapter, Revelation, the 18th chapter, she sinks into the sea every time. The swine went down into the, to the sea. That's a Babylonian system. And it says here in verse 24, Therefore I say unto you, What things soever you I tell, oh, it doesn't say desire. Whatsoever things you I tell desire, well, first of all, you ought to be keeping God's commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight, don't you? And it, that's why it's so good to look these words up in a Strong's and then take your, then take your, uh, your word study concordance and look at all the times it's used because a lot of times it'll be a different word in different verses. It's not the word ask here, it's the word desire, but it's the same word, I tell. Whatsoever things you desire. How do you get what you desire? Keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing. That's how you get it. What is it that's pleasing to God? Whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you shall receive them and you shall have them. Believe is the word, believe is the verb form of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Substance is the word hypostasis. Hypostasis means to hupo under stasis stand. Hypostasis means to understand, but there's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. If you have an understanding, Faith is, or believe is. Whatsoever you ask when you pray, believe you receive and you shall have. Understand. If you understand, you become a learner. The word learner in the Greek is the word disciple. It's the word mathetes. We get the word mathematics from M-A-T-H-E-T-E-S. Get the word mathematics. If you're a math student, you have the only way you can learn is crucify self and go by the rules of math. All the axioms, the postulates. You can't have mathematics without having the, have it, without having the laws of mathematics. You've got to follow all of it. And if you're a disciple, you're a learner, and Jesus said, you cannot be my disciple without a daily cross. Luke, 20, Luke 14, 24. Without a daily cross. So faith is understanding. When you're understanding, you're a learner or a disciple. That can't come without death to self. So if you receive the things that you ask... You got to keep his commandments, or if whatsoever you ask when you pray, bind to the will of God. Ask is keeping his commandments and doing the things that are pleasing. And that's what believe is that's death to self. Faith is death to self. So you can't get anything that you ask unless self dies first. You can't get anything from God until you learn. You have to be bowing to his will. People say, I see these guys on TV and somebody gets shot. Maybe four or five people get shot out of in some building. And some knucklehead, a politician will stand up in front of the camera and say, we're praying for them. You mean you're bowing to the will of God for them? <laughs> You're saying, Lord, thank you for the death of these loved ones and give these people the strength to get through it. That's not what you're saying. We're wishing for you. That's what they mean. I don't even believe they mean that. I mean, I believe that what they mean is we're saying platitudes for you. That's all they mean. It seems like everywhere I hear the word prayer, it don't mean what the Bible means. Jesus said, when we pray, we're to pray, our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will is being done. You're not giving God permission to do his will. 
when you pray, thy will be done. Not in your life. His will is being done in your life whether you want it or not. When you start praying, you start saying, Lord, your will is being done in my life. Even this broken leg or losing my job, that's your will. And you know you've what you've got ahead for me. And it's not just a dead end. You've got some other work for me to do. Now, we've got to get back to what's pleasing to God. Romans 12 and 1. And that verse... It's all through the New Testament. That verse about whatsoever you ask when you pray, believe you receive. Now do you understand what ask, pray, and believe mean? Ask, pray, and believe all means to bow to God's will. And Romans 12 and 1 will tell you how you please God. Romans 12 and 1. All right. When he said, do the things that are pleasing in his sight, 1 John 3.22, the word pleasing is the word A-R-E-S-K-O. It means to please God. You're going to have to go to some other verses to find out what pleases God, particularly this verse right here. In Romans 12 and 1, this will tell you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. What is a living sacrifice? You tell me. How do you sacrifice your bodies? Tell the truth to people. That's right. You're living in truth daily, and they'll crucify you when you tell them, take your cross and die daily. Huh? Death to self. When you tell them Christmas is Christ's Mass, it's Roman Catholicism, that will upset most people. That's death to self. When you tell them predestination is true and God does not love everybody, that's death to self because most people are not going to like you for that. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God. That word acceptable is a, it's the word you arrest to E-U-A-R-E-S-T-E-O. It is a construction of you and aresco. Death to self is well pleasing in the sight of God. You cannot Ask for anything you want unless you're dying. This doesn't have anything to do with what you want. Nothing. A lot of times when I'm praying for somebody, I just say, Lord, help them. I don't know what they need. You know. You know how to get them out of this mess they're in. I pray for some of y'all. You don't even know I'm praying for you. My wife don't know that. When you're in a in a bind, you don't know what to do. I may just be riding down the road and say a quick prayer. Lord, help them. They don't know what to do. That's what we do when we pray. Sometimes the world gets to caving in. Oh, man, I got people that are fussing with each other, and I'm going, Lord, I don't know what to do. You know. Lord, you do it. I don't even know what to ask for. We don't know what to ask for as we ought. That's what the Scripture tells us in Romans, the 8th chapter. But we groan. We're groaning. The word groan is the sound we make when we're going through the narrow way. Groan is the word stenazo. It is a form of the word stenos. Stenos is the noun. Groan is the verb. This is groan. Stenos is the word straight is the gate. 
and narrow is the way. Straight. Straight means to crowd through a narrow opening. The world is crowding us on every side when we're telling them the truth. Do you ever feel that way? You should. Do you ever feel like that when you're trying to tell people about the Christ Mass and you, and you don't feel good and it makes you miserable? Does it ever make anybody miserable besides me? It, it's, that's normal. That's normal for the believer. I'm sorry, but that's normal. If you try to sidestep these things when you're around kinfolks, you're around somebody that's a personal friend, and you want to sidestep them, I have a hard time witnessing to everybody I come in contact with. If you don't have a hard time ever, then you're better than I am. I witness a lot, talk to a lot of people. I don't bend anybody's arm behind their back and say, pray this prayer and repeat after me. I don't believe in that. I believe in telling people the truth and that's it. If they are elect of God, they'll come around, won't they? Now, let me finish this. What is pleasing to God is death to self. You can't get anything that you ask unless you're giving your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's only reasonable. The word reasonable is the word L-O-G-I-K-O-S. It is your logical service, the logical thing for you to do. It comes from the word logos. Logos is the word word. It is your service to the word of God, what he wants you to do. I know you have a, the reason I know you have a hard time witnessing every opportunity you get, because through the years I've had a hard time learning to be real open with people, afraid I was going to offend them. And guess what? You will. <laughs> Maybe your mother, your brothers, your sister, your neighbor, your father. Do some of you have a hard time witnessing to your family? That's tough, isn't it? What other purpose would there be for us in this world? That's right. We don't have another purpose. Our purpose <laughs> is to live for God in this world, like Mary said. Now, let me give you a couple other verses on this word. On this word, look over here in. You ought to be accept. Here's the word you are to owe again. Look at Second Corinthians five. <coughs> Second Corinthians five. And. Verse nine. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. Accepted is the word you arrest. Oh. Well, pleasing. We're, we're laboring in this world to please God and nothing else. Let me give you a couple of more of these. Uh, look here in, uh, look over here. In uh, Philippians 4, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. It's talking about how you can, 418, I gave you this earlier, but 4 and 18. But I have all, I have all. What does he mean, I have all? He's in jail here. Philippians is a prison epistle. He's writing from jail. He's very shortly going to die with his head cut off. But he says, I have all. What all is he talking about? Talking about the context of this chapter when he says, not that I speak in respect of want, in verse 11, for I have learned... 
manthano, which is a form of mathetuo, which is the word disciple. I've had to learn through the years. Paul is an old man here. He's in prison at Rome waiting to be executed. And he said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now, you can't learn that today unless you're ready to die. Content is a word that means it's the word ought or case. This is the word content. Until you get close to death, you're not going to be able to be this. A-U-T A-R-K-E-O A-R-K-E-O A-U-T A-R-K-E-O That doesn't look like our word content, but it is. But when you find out what it means, it comes from auto. Auto is our word auto. It's the word self. When you have an autobiography, you have a biography that's given by the man himself about his life. That's an autobiography. You could have a biography that's forbidden. Kitty Kelly is a biographer out in Halloween. She's written a lot of biographies that were not permitted by the person she wrote about. That was not a best of biographies. Auto means self. An automobile is self-mobile. This word self, auto is self, archaeo. This is the word content. Archaeo means to ward off or push away. That's the way we'd say. We'd say push away. Remember that inner and that outer man, the outer man is self. Paul said, I've learned to get a control of self by killing him off. That self out of our lives is contentment. I have never known the kind of contentment I have. When I was younger, I was trying to make money for me. I was trying to get ahead for me. Has anybody tried to do that besides me? Now, don't lie. And the rest of you ought to be ashamed you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> I have been guilty. It was all about me. As I grew older, God caused me to be free-hearted, to be able to give to people what I have, loan them what I have. And that took forever for me to come to that. You want my shoes? You can have them. You want this shirt? Just let me get another one to put on. You can have it. That's the way I feel now. If you need it, don't come up and say, I want your shirt. I don't need one, but. Now, let's read this here in Philippians 4.18. Well, let's read down to it. I know, and they said, I'm content. And this is what happens when you're content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. I know how to be nothing and how to have everything. He's in jail waiting to be executed. Boy, this is something, isn't it? Everywhere in all things I am instructed to be full and to be hungry, to abound and suffer need. Then he says that famous statement that all the football players and all the wrestlers and all the ultimate fighters put on have tattooed somewhere across their body, which has nothing to do with fighting or winning a football game. I can do all these things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It don't mean I can build factories and build companies. It don't mean I can win this football game against Alabama. Uh, the reason I said that, I like for Alabama about to lose. <laughs> I guess the Patriots, through Christ which strengthens me. It's not talking about that. I can abound and suffer need through Christ which strengthens me. That's what he's saying. 
I can be full and be hungry through Christ who strengthens me. Notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with my afflictions. Now ye Philippians know also, talking about the Philippian church, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. It was the Philippians that Paul went to to pay the bills of the Corinthians. They were too lazy. He, when Paul said, I robbed other churches to pay your obligations, Corinth, it was the Philippians that gave. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that it may abound to your account. He's not talking about a fruit basket. He's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so forth. But I have all. I'm about to die, and I've got everything. I've got all that it takes through Christ that strengthens me to be full and to be hungry, to abound and suffer in aid. But wouldn't it be great to be in that state of mind so you wouldn't want anything else in your life? But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell. He's not talking about eternity perfume. <laughs> a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing, you arrestao. The very thing you got to have when you ask of God. Unless you're doing well pleasing, don't pray for anything. It's not prayer. It's you're just wishing. Dear God, I wish in the name of Jesus you'll let me have that car or that house that we've been looking at. It's not prayer. He says, well pleasing to God. You arresto. And maybe one more verse. Read nineteen. Huh? Read nineteen. You want to read nineteen? But my God shall supply all your need. Need for what? Need to be able to abound and suffer need. need. Nobody quotes these two verses right. This has to do with being in jail, crucifying self ready to die. That's what it has to do with. It doesn't mean, don't quote some, I, uh, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. See, hey, if you need that new car, he'll give it to you. No, that's not what it's about. It's about abounding and suffering need. It's easy to quote verse 11, I've learned to be content, but boy, when you get to verse 12, about I know how to abound and suffer need to be hungry and full, and then God will supply all that need. My God shall supply all this need, and I can do all these things through Christ who strengthens me. These are two verses, verse 13 and verse 19, that everybody misquotes. My God shall supply all your need to abound and suffer need, to be hungry and to be full, according to his riches and glory. Now, I got one other verse I want to give to you on this. Go back here to Galatians. Go back to Galatians. So you can't just pray and get what you want. You can't just ask God and get what you want. You've got to be pleasing God and 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 you've got to be keeping his commandments. I would never pray. Knowing what I know, I'll never ask. I never ask for me for anything. I'll pray often. Lord, you know that I would like to have a church building. That's up to you. I cannot con men into giving their money to have a church building. 
I can't do that. They'll have a big meeting to have a church rally, and they'll say, who would give $5,000? Who will give $20,000 to all the rich guys in the church? I saw one man one time say, brother, I'd like to give $25,000. I thought, you have your reward. Bragging in the front of the people like that. And 25000 to him was like pennies. It's kind of like the woman that gave the two mites. And Jesus said she's given more than all. She gave all that she had out of her penury, out of her need. Now, look here in Galatians. In Galatians. I may have to read several of these. See the, several of these verses. All right. Hold on. Let's read down here in... <clears throat> Down here in uh, in verse nine, well, let's read verse eight, chapter. verse chapter one of Galatians. And though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel. Boy, there's so many definitions to the gospel. The gospel's a resurrection. Resurrection means to come to life after dying. That's a daily cross. That's faith. Faith is death to self. It's a daily cross. If anyone preaches the gospel, is prepare you the way of the Lord. Prepare way. And the way is narrow. Narrow is the word thalibo. Comes from the word thalipsis, which is the word tribulation. See, if you don't know what these words mean, that's the word tribulation. We must have much tribulation. That's the gospel. That's also the blood baptism. Blood baptism in Luke, the third chapter, verses 1 through 3. Verses 1 through 3 the Bible says that John came preaching the baptism with repentance, which was prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's called the blood baptism, and it's called the gospel, and the gospel is resurrection. It means to come to life after dying, and you've got to be dying to get what you ask. You've got to be death to self to get what you pray for, prayer. Wherever I wrote that, I erased it. it you gotta, in order to be believing, you've got to be dying to the flesh. You say, Jim, that seems just so hard for me. I know it's hard for everybody. What you have to do is seek self for so long till you get tired of self. You've got to seek self till you start finding out when you get older this ain't working. I think I'll start seeking others instead of me. I was in my 60s, maybe mid-late 60s, before I started really seeing that. And what it has done for my life, it's made my life easier. It's, let me put it this way. I've said this so many times, I can't count. If you've got 12 people you got 12 people. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And y'all in 12. One here. You got 12 people. And they're all seeking self. How many people do you have looking out for you? You got one. One. It's just you against all the rest. If you have the same 12 people and they're all looking out for each other, 
They're not looking out for self. How many do you have looking after you? You have 11. You got 11 looking after you when you're trying to take care of others. There's nothing like being able to reach out for other people. That's the greatest reward I've learned in life. And I haven't had that in my heart about 12, 14. It was something that started working on me in my 50s. I noticed every time I'd argue with somebody or fight with them, they'd fight me back. I never did have somebody in the middle of an argument go, well, gosh, I see what you're saying. I understand now. They never did do that. But whenever I would be real gentle, when somebody would be giving me a hard time, I would pretend it wasn't even happening. I'd say, well, they love me. They don't mean that. I'd go up to them and hug them. If I knew they said something to me about me, I'd hug them and say, how you doing? How's everything going? I'd go out of my way to do that. Have you learned that yet? That's what Jesus means when he says, whatsoever man... Whatsoever you would that men do to you, do you also to them. That is the that is the golden rule. It's in different wording, but it's over there in the sixth chapter of Luke. Whatever you want people to do to you, not what they do to you, do to them what you want them to do to you. But if you do it first, they don't want to do. They've had something against you. All right. Look here in this right here. Look at verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Something besides coming to life after dying. Something besides, besides pleasing God. Something besides the blood baptism, death. Blood baptism is death to self, isn't it? Death to self is the best news for the believer. But it's a shame that we all got that outer man, but this is something we got to wrestle through. We got the outer man, which is self, and serves the law of the flesh. We got the inner man, which is Christ in you, that is against that outer man. And over years and years and years of trials and fire and persecution, and everything you have to go through, your arrogance and your pride will burn out. Well, if you get to be 70 and it hasn't started waning in you, something's wrong with your life. If you get to be 65 and it's not kind of dying away and you're not saying to yourself, I think I've been handling this wrong. That's repentance. Repent, metanoia. means to be turned because you cannot turn yourself to be turned and to think differently whenever I say quit thinking about yourself but think about others that's thinking different than you used to has anybody here I shouldn't ask you this because if you don't raise your hand you're lying <laughs> has anybody here had a problem thinking about yourself and you can't seem to get your mind off yourself and get it on others. If you start looking out for other people's problems, you say, Jim, I don't have a lot to help them with. You got yourself. If you know they feel bad, call them. Go by and see them. Just say, I wonder how he's doing. You may not be able to give them a, a bag of gold, but you can give them a loaf of bread if they don't have a lot. Can't you? That's the mind of Christ, isn't it? Well, if they'd behave themselves and get their lives right, I'll do that. God, Jesus didn't say, <laughs> give to others when they're doing right and they're really good Christians. He didn't say that. that is, it's usually people that are not, don't have their head together that they need some help. And you can be the one that teaches them the likeness of Jesus, which you're predestinated to. Huh? How much time do I have, Mike? Eight. Eight. 
if I get through this, then I'll get on to the next subject next week. He says, I marvel you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not death to self. It's not the resurrection, coming to life after dying. This goes with Second Corinthians 11 and 4. Paul said some men are coming to Corinth preaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel that I haven't preached. And what I'm afraid of, I'm afraid you'll follow them, he said. But the amazing thing that he says, he goes on in that chapter and tells you who the other Jesus is. He says the other Jesus is Satan. It's Satan transforming himself into an angel of light. I believe these preachers in these pulpits are preaching another Jesus, which is Satan. It says Satan transforming. Transform is word meta schematizo. Metaschematizo means to disguise oneself. You can't tell Satan by what he looks like. He looks like Jesus. He looks like that Jesus who's a real nice Jesus that's got the Cub Scout sign up like this. You know, he's a real pretty, easy-talking Jesus. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. I think of Jesus of the Bible. You know what I think of? Jesus when I, says, when I come back, my eyes will be as a flame of fire. I'll be taking vengeance on all those that know not God, that obey not the gospel, that obey not the true gospel, which is death to self, daily cross, self denial, the blood baptism. That's what I think of. I think of the 19th chapter. I don't think of gentle Jesus making low that, it, that doesn't have any fire and anger. When he comes back in the 19th chapter of Revelation, he's coming back and his eyes are going to be as a flame of fire. You want to be a recipient of that or you want to be with him? I'm willing to sacrifice today for tomorrow. You got to want that bad enough to give up today. And then he goes on to say, How long is eternity? Huh? Yeah. But though we are an angel from heaven, angelos, messenger, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let that man be accursed. Anathema. Cut off from God. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? I'm not trying to persuade any man. I'm trying to tell people what God said. Or do I seek to please a resco? <coughs> Do I seek to please man? I should not be the servant of Christ if I am trying to please a resco man. I'm trying to be as gentle as I can out in public. I'm tougher in the pulpit than I am out in public. Out in public, I'm gentle with people. I'm very assertive about the Bible. Somebody says something, I'll say, that's not what that means. If you want to know, I'll tell you. Usually they say, well, I don't care about that. I say, okay, see you around. Now leave them alone. It's not my job to make people believe the truth. But when they go to these verses talking about ask whatsoever you ask, whatsoever you desire, I tell is the word. That's one of my favorite things to preach on in the Bible. Ask, pray, believe. Every one of those words means to bow 
to the will of God and die to the flesh. You can't get what you ask. I need to send this tape to David Jeremiah. Say, watch this and listen. Because, boy, he says some stupid things about asking. Do I have any time? Three. Three minutes. I'm going to get in this series. I'm going to go into Christmas. Because men who are twisting the word of God, like twisting, ask, prayer, and believe, they're twisting Christmas. The Bible says that these men are froward. Froward. Every time you find the word froward in the Old Testament, there's about 12 words for froward. Every one of them means to pervert or twist. They're twisting the Word of God to get what they want. They tell those charismatics, will tell people, you can get whatever you want if you believe it and say it with your mouth. That's, that's uh, Far East mysticism. That's what it is. That was brought to America by a man named E.W. Kenyon in the 30s and Oral Roberts and Kenneth Hagin got a hold of this. Kenneth Hagin was the first one to get a hold of that. Everything is full of positive and negative vibrations, including your voice, and you'll get whatever you say. If it's positive, you get it. If you're negative, you'll get that. How can that be when God has already arranged everything from the beginning to the end? The times before appointed are by God and the boundary of their habitation of the timing of everything is said and done. It's as though it's already done. So when things happen in your life, learn. You can't change it. You can pray, Lord, I don't know what I need. You know. That's the only praying we can do. Hallowed be thy name. You know what we have to do when we say hallowed? Hallowed Haggiadzo is a form of holy. Make your name, your authority, holy in my life. And Lord, destroy my name. That's what you're saying. Hallowed be thy name. Make your name holy. Get rid of me in my name. Let us make us a name was the doctrine of Babylon. And all, all idolatry in the world was founded on let us make up our own name, our own authority. That's what we've done. I'll, I'm still not through with the charismatic doctrine. There's so much to it that I'm not trying to give these guys a hard time. They're liars. The Bible says I'm to be angry with them. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, be angry and sin not. I'm going to come back next week with that. I'm going to move on into the Christmas message. I'm moving into it on Wednesday night. Christmas is nothing but man's excuse to have his way so he don't have to crucify self. It's the mass of Roman Catholicism. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, help us. Help me, Lord, to live for you so I can be an example to these people. Help us to contain our desires and our tempers. Deal with us in everything so we'll do your will. I know all I can do is tell the people here and some doesn't have enough experience, enough fire in their lives to, to turn every day. But Lord, give them, that, give them that fire that they will turn. We know you will. Fight our enemies. Lead us to your elect family. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Hey, Dwayne. I couldn't help. I couldn't come in for a while because I didn't want to get up 20 times. But I got whooped today. Thank you. <laughs> I can tell I haven't been in a while. Hey. Got whooped. Hanging on. Well, we all need a good whipping. Well, God's whipped me so long. He's beat me half to death. But I gotta keep. We gotta keep coming in here. A reminder. You do. <laughs> it's just. Thank you. It's not easy. No, it's not. Being a Christian is, well, Peter said, if the righteous scarcely be saved, scarcely mogus means with great difficulty. God makes it tough on us dying to the flesh. She makes it tough on me too. <laughs> Thank you.